Nikita Kulshina was a Moscow activist with the Russian punk collective Pussy Riot. Now she's in Georgia fleeing arrest for defying Vladimir Putin. My hope is that somebody from Putin's circle just will kill him. I don't know. That's my best wish. She's part of a Russian diaspora taking flight from Putin's dictatorship and the war they see as a crime. And they're prepared to live in exile to denounce his regime. I think the moment I go back, I will be just uh, detained by the police. And inside Russia, we'll meet some of the dissidents risking their lives to stay. It's a terrible, senseless war, and we need to stop it. Georgia is a former Soviet republic on Russia's southern border. It's famous for its music, food and wine and love of life. It feels far removed from war-torn Ukraine. but it's become a flashpoint for refugees. Both Ukrainians fleeing Russian bombs and Russians escaping their own government. These days, just calling Putin's war a war can see Russians jailed for up to 15 years. And since his special operation began in February, tens of thousands of Russians have fled here to Georgia, one of the few places they can live without visas. They include journalists, dissidents, artists, activists, all wondering how they can oppose this war and when or if they can ever go home. You see them everywhere in the capital, Tbilisi, collecting humanitarian aid for Ukraine, gathering in bookshops selling banned Russian books, or staging protests that would see them beaten and jailed in Russia. Today, it's a commemoration for civilians slaughtered by Russian troops in Bucha. This is the Russian resistance, people who love their country but hate what Putin is doing in their name. How can it be not a crime? How can killing people can be not a crime? Destroying people, people's lives, uh, their homes, uh, their families, uh, their future, of course it is a crime. What, can, what else can it be? Christina left Moscow days after the invasion began, knowing it could be many years before she returns. She's asked us not to say her age or full name for fear of reprisals against her family in Russia. And I knew that I wouldn't be able to keep silent. And I had a choice. Either I would stay uh, in Russia and go to jail, or I would move to other country and would try to do something to support uh, people in uh, Ukraine and support people uh, in Russia who can't leave for many reasons. Anton Mikhalchuk works for an organization helping settle the flood of Russians now arriving. He says the Russians here are just one part of an exploding diaspora. Uh, Vladimir Putin says every single one of them is a traitor. No, любой народ, а тем более российский народ, всегда сможет от, отличить истинных патриотов от подонков и предателей и просто выплюнет их, как случайно залетевшую в рот мушку, выплюнет на панель. Убежден, такое естественное и необходимое самоочищение общества только укрепит нашу страну. 
While Russians have flooded in since February, Putin has been tightening the noose on opposition for years. Here it's kind of an empty space now. A lot of Nikita Nikulshina fled here in July, bringing a fire of hatred for Putin that has only burned brighter with the war. Oh my God, my country, my country go to the war to Ukraine. And I fucking love Ukraine. And also I fucking love Russia. Nika is a prominent artist with Pussy Riot, a feminist performance group that dared to ridicule Putin and all who supported his dictatorship. From the Russian Orthodox Church to police. The day of the World Cup final in Moscow, she and three others dressed in police uniforms to invade the field, stopping the match as the president looked on. So, yeah, I decided just to say, like, out loud that, fuck the police. Yeah, and you ran out in the field in front of Putin. Yeah. Yeah. And you embarrassed him. You made Putin look... Hope so. Hope he was crying. Yeah, but that made you a target. Yes, but it's not a problem for me because um, I cannot imagine how could I like live in Russia and be silent. In court, she was defiant. She kept smiling even after she was sentenced to 15 days in detention. But it was just the start of a campaign to force her to leave Russia. As she continued her activism, she was continually re-arrested and thrown back into detention. Finally, she drove straight from a cell to the airport. So when I was like fourth time in detention center, I decided that I had to leave because I think that I can be more powerful like outside. I can talk from here. Even then I will like just sit in the jail and do nothing. So this was the signal that no, 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 Nika, you're not welcome here, like not anymore. So now I really think that I will not be able to go to Russia till Putin will, I don't know, die, disappear, become a bug or something. So yes, I think we need to wait for his death. Which could be years. Which could be years. When Nika and her friends were first jailed, other members of Pussy Riot made this video appealing for their release. Riley urging police to be good cops, not bad. But one by one, they've also been forced to leave Russia, moving to North America and Europe. Sasha Sofeyev joined Nika in Tbilisi. So have you left Russia for forever or what? What's your plan? No, нет, конечно. Я когда уезжал, я надеялся на то, чтобы максимально скоро вернуться. Вот, но мы видим, что идут месяцы, а ситуация становится всё хуже, катастрофически хуже и а пока я совершенно точно не могу вернуться с безопасностью для себя. Putin's invasion of Ukraine has been accompanied by a vicious crackdown inside Russia. Since February, the last vestiges of democracy have been stamped out with brute force. Protests have been crushed, opposition figures have been jailed. Journalists daring to question the war have been silenced. Challenging the government inside Russia is now all but impossible. Even individuals holding blank sheets of paper are being dragged off to jail cells. Yet some persevere despite the risks. Our crew in Russia managed to speak to some. 
Yelena Ogsibova is 76. Too old and too stubborn to leave Russia, she continues to brave arrest. She lives in St. Petersburg, her small apartment filled with her other passion, painting. She has put that skill to work creating anti-war posters. Police keep confiscating them. Yelena was born in the aftermath of the siege of Leningrad, when Nazis blockaded St. Petersburg, starving nearly a million people to death. Putin has tried to emulate this mythology, claiming absurdly that Ukraine is run by Nazis. Yelena will have none of it. No, это они же все же придумано. Что там? Что за глупости? И вот это все эти годы. Это же воспитывалось все вот эти годы последние при этой власти. Уже мало кто помнит и войну и все это. Кто помнит, действительно пережил, они этого не, не могут говорить. Елена's age gives her some leeway to speak out. Police are less likely to jail or beat her. But she's still vulnerable to ordinary Russians who see her as a traitor. State media have pushed a relentless line that Putin's critics are foreign agents. It's reinforced with non-stop nationalist propaganda, the letter Z an omnipresent symbol of the promised victory in Ukraine. It takes extraordinary courage to push back. Всем привет! Это Таня Фельгенгауэр. Спасибо, что смотрите мой канал. Пока YouTube еще работает, подписывайтесь и распространяйте. Татьяна Фельгенгауэр is one of Russia's most prominent independent journalists. But her only access to the public now is making YouTube content from her Moscow apartment. Депутаты и сенаторы спешно приняли закон о безумных сроках за публикации фейках о военной операции. А пропаганда увеличивает продолжительность зомбо-шоу. В этой ситуации... Her old station, Echo of Moscow, Russia's last independent radio station, was shut down on March 3. Its signal taken over by state propaganda. I feel so many emotions. Uh, I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm shocked, I'm mad. I cannot spend all my emotions on propaganda. I have to spend it on the truth, on my audience, on the stopping this terrible war. Tatiana has put her life on the line before. In 2017, a crazed nationalist broke into her studio and stabbed her in the neck. She nearly bled to death. Weeks later, she was back on air. Now she's not sure how much longer she can keep going. For now, I am in Moscow. I stay here. I want to stay here as long as possible. But I don't know, maybe tomorrow 
I have to live. Maybe in a week, but for now, I'm here. Most journalists have already self-censored or escaped. The news website TV Rain was a fearless critic of Putin's policies. Programs by its presenter Yekaterina Kotrikatse and her husband Tikhon Tsyadko were seen by up to 25 million people a day. On March 3 it closed down to prevent its staff being jailed. Signing off with the outlawed statement, no war. It was the end of independent television in Russia. Hours later, Tikhon and Yekaterina, who was Georgian by birth, fled Russia, flying to Tbilisi to continue their work. Thanks for your time today. I know you're busy. Thank you. They have traded comfortable lives in Moscow for the uncertainty and hardship of exile. This has been the most stressful and terrible moments of my life, honestly, and I think Tikhon's as well, because, I mean, we have decided everything that we were living and we have decided to, uh, you know, to, to have some stuff and wake up kids in the middle of the night. It was like very fast, a couple of hours and the whole life has changed. They're sure Putin will never restore what he's taken away. As a product of, of the media, he perfectly understands that those who can control the information control the, uh, the world. So, so it has never been easy for the independent media, but last month changed everything. И, конечно, главная тема этого стрима, этого эфира – события в Буче, э, жуткие совершенно кадры, которые все вы видели, даже если не хотели, то… Like Tatiana Felgenhauer in Moscow, Yekaterina and Tikhon make YouTube content from their temporary home in Tbilisi. They admit it is harder outside Russia. Uh, we can report on Russia because we have still people in Moscow, in other cities. Uh, we have connections, we have friends, we have, you know, different ways of coverage, covering the, the, you know, the situation, the crisis, the catastrophe that is going on. But still, it's not the same uh, if you leave the country. Even so, Tikhon has managed to get one interview that outraged the Kremlin. He was one of a handful of independent Russian reporters to speak to the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky. Well, I think he's very honest and he looks very transparent. Like he, he actually, he tells us what he actually thinks. He's not pretending to be someone. He's not like Putin. Yeah, <laughs> apparently. So what is going on in Putin's mind? I think he looks like a person who doesn't have access to the right information. It's long been known that Putin never looks at the internet, relying solely on documents provided by his inner circle. Tikhon Syadko says COVID has left him even more out of touch. The last two years with this COVID, I think that he is more isolated than he used to be because he is paranoid about COVID. You saw these pictures when he met uh, Russian ministers of defense and uh, foreign, uh, foreign affairs. affairs, and they are sitting uh, at this uh, huge table, which means that he is more misinformed than before because he only gets information from from a few people, yeah. and uh, I don't think he he has a. It's, it's hard to have, to have a plan when you don't have any information. He has lost the connection with the reality, as a lot of people say, and there are some, you know, leaks from inner circles saying that there is a huge problem of Vladimir Putin's understanding this, the whole situation in Ukraine. And he still is understand. He still thinks that he's winning there. The mirage is reinforced by Russian television, now almost completely under Kremlin control. There is no news of defeats or casualties, just liberated Ukrainians grateful for Russian aid. 
Some news reports are just fabricated to suggest Ukrainians are faking atrocities. In fact, this was footage from a Russian film set making crash test dummies. Hey, Christina, how are you? Christina, who I met at the Butcher commemoration, is doing what she can for refugees in Tbilisi, buying them essentials like food and toiletries. So you're buying all this out of your own money? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I mean, it's normal right now. But you haven't got much money. I mean, you're not a rich person. Well, uh, I have enough to, to live. She's staying in a cheap hostel, scratching a living as a digital nomad, doing IT work. We need uh, some toothbrushes, toothpaste. This one is a bit more pretty. Sweets for kids? Actually, I think for everyone. <laughs> everyone needs uh, sugar. Uh, sometimes people care about kids uh, and they don't care about uh, this much about adults or elderly people. Some snacks. They say snacks uh, help to relieve stress too. Take this and then buy also some uh, uh, shampoos and everything. And, and, Oh, but, but I want to. I'm sorry. I'm, no, no. I insist. I'm sorry. I'm very stubborn. <laughs> the shopkeeper wants to give it for free. But yeah. uh, I know it's hard to keep business, and uh, I actually want to support local business. Not on this. Not on this. This distribution center is run by Russian and Georgian volunteers. Refugee families come here to find clothes, food or toys, anything to bring a sense of normality to their children. Daria fled the Ukrainian city of Cherniv as it came under heavy bombardment. He says, so you send me? Most Georgians share the disgust at Putin's war. The streets of Tbilisi are covered in Ukrainian flags and messages of support. But there's a dilemma for the Russian resistance here. The hostility to the invasion can sometimes translate into hostility to all Russians, even dissidents who have fled here in opposition to Putin. Well, this is an indication of how the Russian arrivals are viewed by some Georgians. There are banners with QR codes to find the best Georgian restaurants, to open a bank account, to find accommodation. But when you click on them, you're not taking that information. You're taken straight to videos of Russian atrocities with a tagline that it's not just Putin's war, it's Russian aggression. The reason for the animosity can be seen just outside Tbilisi. 60 kilometers away is the border of South Ossetia, a Georgian province that has been effectively occupied by Russia. Russia invaded in 2008 in support of separatists there. It means Russian troops and tanks are less than an hour's drive from the center of Tbilisi. I was here in 2008 when uh, Russia attacked Georgia and the it was terrible, and we understood that he can do it, just like that. And he can do it any time again. While the invasion of Ukraine has enraged Georgians, 
Critics claim it has cowed the Georgian government. There are frequent demonstrations outside parliament demanding the government do more for Ukraine. Georgia has been hesitant to criticise Russia and impose sanctions. That's why we know that the Georgian government is not happy with us being here. Well, are they afraid of Russian President Vladimir yeah. Putin bombing Georgia because we are here? Because he doesn't like that Russian opposition exists. People and journalists, they, well, yeah, exist, <laughs> but that, that they are here in Tbilisi. Nika Nikulshina has tried to channel her experience into art, expressing the anguish of fleeing her home and losing everything she had. <laughs> now she wonders how long she can stay here. She and her fellow pussy rioter, Sasha Safayev, have generally been welcomed by Georgians. But she's also found hostility. Yeah, it happens from time to time. You walk down the street and you see F-U-C-K Russians written on the walls everywhere. I still have a PTSD after like all that happened in Russia. And now I have it more because like really a couple of times I have this not very considerations with like fuck you, you're Russia and stuff. Я думаю, что это всё наоборот, потому что если мы берём историю наших взаимоотношений России и Грузии в новейшую историю, то есть последние, да, вот 30 лет, то я просто поражаюсь, как грузинам вообще хватает достоинства не нападать на русских на улицах, потому что I don't agree with you. I heard like two times like you're Russian, go fuck yourself. I'm so sorry, but yeah, it happened like a couple no, times. But what worries Nika far more is that the government may force her to leave, not because she's Russian, but because she's anti-Putin. In Georgia now, the government is kind of pro-Russian. So I really kind of waiting like every day that one day somebody will knock my door and um, I don't know, bring me to Chechnya and then back to Russia. So you still have that fear? Sure, it's kind of paranoia, I know it, but it's kind of like, why not? So it's kind of scary, but no. Georgia is super cool and especially Tbilisi is super cool because this is kind of a lot of democracy here and open-minded people. At the age of 24, Nika is beginning the life of an exile. Unlike the millions who fled Ukraine, there can be no going home when the war is over. She and the other emigres must wait for Putin to die and hope the Russia he leaves behind will be a land worth living in.